All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, KCP Community Meeting, January fourth, twenty twenty-two. We are officially living in the future. Um, I we have a somewhat packed agenda, I guess. I mean, the the prototype two, two goals will probably take a while. Um, if there's anything else anybody wants to talk about, feel free to toss it on there. Um, but uh, Stefan, who I think is here. I believe I'm yeah here. great uh stefan wanted to talk about uh prototype two goals and what we are hoping to get done before i think we said the end of this month um so yeah i think the current source of truth on that is this project board if that is not the case um speak now um which uh i don't know how we want to go through these top to bottom or um whatever this one's me um, maybe i have i have one suggestion can we identify those which are optional and talk about those which are must like i see sure. login interface which is great but it's it's a source for bike shedding and i'm not sure where we are with that uh which one was a source for bike shedding uh structured logging Oh, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, I also think, I mean, like, yeah, that one that one feels optional to me for, for um, you know, definitely nice to have, but not something we need, need, need for a, for a prototype. Like, the people using the prototype won't be aware of what logging we're using anyway. Um, so, yeah, maybe as we go through them, we can, we can take note of which ones don't necessarily fit. Um, I know that we will... For the first two, at least, uh, we will need to be able to register a physical cluster with KCP and install the sinker. Um, I would guess this means do better than the current thing we do today, because the current thing we do today works, uh, but kind of sucks, um, because we're just going to ask you to give us a kube config and you know with all the with all the powers that enjoys, and then uh, use that to install our agent. Um, this might be one in, to Stefan to your point. If we start running out of time, this might be one that gets that gets pushed off because it works. It works okay, but it's not like ideal. It's not what we yep. want to go to prod with. Of all of the things, having a uh, like giving someone root to a whole bunch of things and then going and doing your own stuff is great for user experience, but it's really bad for like the mindset of running something as a service. Yeah, so it's probably say like of all of them. Figuring out what the minimal set of permissions you need, even if even if that minimal set of permissions is the exact same permissions we have today, that would probably be an acceptable minimum path. Which is, the someone needs to be able to install the agent. It won't be us. Yeah, yeah. I think the uh, right. I think the item one and two are related in that the correct way to register your cluster is not to give us a kube config and let us toy around in it and do whatever we want. It's to install the agent and that agent subscribes or, or registers itself. Um, well, that, well, someone to define the permissions you need to run that agent on a given cluster and has it, and then being able to clearly document that so someone can do it. Having a simplified, easy flow is great, but that's a add on on top of that basic thing. And I think that would probably be the acceptable minimum, I think. Yeah, so I will. Um, I will at least write down better in that multi-cluster doc what I think the registration process should be. And then if we all agree on that, we can start writing code to flesh that out. But I think I think we've even made progress in terms of uh, not uh, that Sinker will not be responsible for creating namespaces, for instance, that, that discussion we had uh, probably about a month ago about um, the cluster controller or the you know something outside in KCP outside of the physical cluster will create namespaces, and the sinker won't have to. That's a reasonable, I think, a, a good positive change in the permission structure that we're um, defining. So anyway, yeah, those are those are still on my list, and I will write better docs for that, and then pass them around. And if everybody agrees, we can start writing code. Um, Sketch out design idea identity unification between KCP and physical clusters. Does anyone know more context than that? Mm. 
new investigation from a while ago. I'm gonna yeah, this one over in backlog, I guess. Yeah, we probably need to add some more details to it. There's probably it a couple yeah. of other ones that overlap with it. So yeah. Uh I was in backlog and we don't need to be dealing with the backlog right now. Um yeah, we talked about logging workspace administration and tenancy tenancy pre-filling APIs. Uh Andy, is that how's that going? Um, so I have done all of the bits for getting the simple CRD inheritance working. So you can have a single, uh, you can have a workspace reference another workspace and inherit whatever CRDs are in there. Um, I would potentially consider it done for prototype two, unless we collectively, um, identify bits that are necessary that aren't implemented yet. Okay. In the document about uh, shared uh, critical data, there is a section about that where I, I, I sketched some ideas, but I agree this is probably post prototype two. The technology is basically what you developed, proved it works, and now we have to model something on top to make use of it. But this is next for the next prototype for sure. Great. Uh, great. I'll I'll let uh, Andy or or whoever wants to uh, fill out that and like you know add that context to the issue and close it because it, that uh, seems like we're done for now. Um, minimal RBAC, I think. Is this related to the minimal physical cluster RBAC or minimal RBAC for logical clusters? Workspace later. administration. Logical. Like, yeah. Logical. Um. Hi, this is Serge. Um, I don't know, some of you know me, maybe. Um, I'm on the OpenShift Auth team, previously monitoring. So, Stefan pulled me in um, to look at the Auth bits. Um, thanks for that. So, I'm actively looking into that one. We had already one design session with Stefan on this one. So I have a couple of slides and literally sort of like making my uh, feet wet inside the code base. So I think I found at least found the right spots where I could hook in. Where I'm currently at discussing with Stefan is like what correct abstractions we should use to um, implement the RBAC logic. Um, this one document that Stefan shared to me, there is, a, I believe, a current active discussion around how we want to have informers um, be implemented and at the same time having knowledge of logic clusters without exposing that information. And that's probably something we want to inherit also in the minimal RBAC implementation. There's also a dangling PR currently out there, which I'm looking at, which falls into that category. So uh, yeah, actively working on that one. Awesome. Great. Thank you for, thank you for uh, taking a look at that uh, and let us know how it goes. Um, Cross workspace list watch controller, Steve. I love to comment in this uh, because the body talks about a user can add a second location, application moves between locations, ingress follows application, which uh, doesn't to me that, yeah. re refer to any of this. Um, we have a, a, a number of controllers that list and watch across workspaces right now. Yeah, I think I agree with you. The, the, the title of this and what I thought the title was saying was not the body of this. So I'll take a look. If it is, I, I, th yeah. I think it's a duplicate. We have another issue which I just saw and it has a different comment. So I think we have a copy of that. So it's probably just a copy and paste error. OK. Yeah. Should I okay. copy that over? But so Should, for go ahead. like what? Like the technical capacity to create a controller that does things across workspaces exists, and those controllers like exist in the code base. For the demo, do we like are we expecting like a more cohesive thing that's actually going to be shown off? Is that in addition to this? Uh. I don't know if you were asking me or if I have the answer, but I can give you one, uh, which is I don't think I care how the prototype works so long as it works, right? Like, 
people consuming the prototype aren't aware of the piles and piles sure of I, I guess more like or i guess we're calling it prototype two at some point it was called de maybe demo two or something like do we have is there like a an actual presentation of this functionality that we're expecting to make do we need to have like a end-to-end -end? so the, the the attempt was to get the doc in place for some of the basics of that to cover the high level but i think it probably is the right time steve to go back from an experience point maybe this is like a rob uh rob and i can like take a stab at some parts of it and get a couple other folks involved on the team or whatever to like go through and be like what's the because we talked about this and um you know Stefan has some examples of like what's the like the oc experience what's the cube control experience um like the mindset for prototype two was very much like, as Jason was saying, put like the best foot forward for showing the big ideas. And then that's where at that point we have something that we can say like, Hey, we talked about it last year in May. We made this big pitch that we're going to change the future. Prototype two is like a good realization of enough that we can say like, yeah, like you can see how all these ideas fit together. Uh, don't worry about the man behind the curtain, just focus on like, you know, does this feel right? And so like Rob's got, Rob, you have that deck explaining KCP. Maybe we can like take some of these elements and be like prototype two is the foot forward for saying, here's the future of cube. And here's what exactly what it does and why, and here's why we think it's important. And that pitch will be things that we talk to customers about or um, go to community meetings and say like, Hey, like SIG multi-cluster, like we really want to pitch like Jason did the original pitch of KCP prototype two is out, baby. We've got this great, um, like unified pitch. So maybe it starts with that deck as you're saying, Steve. Okay. And one way to think of this is like, imagine we've got, there's some like big, uh, advanced cube user and they want to go like, Hey, I think, um, KCP solved a lot of the problems my teams are running into. Can I take prototype two and like host an instance for my team to just poke around with Does it even work? you know, minimally for that use case. I think that's kind of what I'm aiming for. Uh, so uh, am I right saying that it's mainly gathering um, all the basic concepts we've been working on, um, you know, uh, control of logical clusters through workspaces, which you can create, and then uh, plugging uh, back on this so that each uh, user only has access to what is his and then being able to just have a minimal experience of sharding, uh, saying, okay, I have one workspace on this shard and another one uh, which is there and can query something on both. I mean, just I the minimum, trying to put yeah. all what we have together. Uh, showing the single instance like it were a shard, which is there's a, a mm. hypothetical place behind the curtains where someone can use cube-like things to to share stuff. So like more of Andy's, um, like the CRD stuff and the inheritance, like how do you operationally scale rolling out a CRD to tens of thousands of applications? Uh, you don't do it like you do it in cube today, right? Like that's, and so like, that's like, like that high vision, like how do you manage APIs, like the control plane for your, for your enterprise, your IT infrastructure? Um, how do you keep control across clouds? So like some of these points is like, well, how would you roll out? A cloud load balancer API change to 55 different cloud uh, clusters, stuff like that. So, and then maybe other parts of it are the um, the workload movement, like just enough of the workload movement, which is kind of something that we had some basic examples, but we're kind of building up to the more general. So, I, I think this is like as Rob said, like we need to be able to show it. Even stuff like the identity, like we don't have to have the right identity unification between the control plane and a physical cluster. Um, but we want to be able to say like, well, Red Hat's going to make some recommendations based on, you know, where we're going and that's going to involve key cloak and the CIM and effort, but it really is just about getting the right connections at each cube cluster. And here's how this whole thing fits together. So there's a KCP version of this. And then we'll have kind of like, as Rob said, like when we go to customers, we'll have the, of Red Hat stuff around it. And then we want to be able to potentially show how someone could come and plug in a different view around it, right? Like this is, you know, large customer or large deployer in of open source KCP and they want to build their own integrations. Where would they plug in? So it's like those three different perspectives are really important, like modeling how someone could really deploy this at scale as an example, and then how someone could take this and then build it on their own. But I think the missing thing from Steve's question was 
there is not a like we would like to have something we could record or take or show to to potential people we would inflict this on but there is not a specific like keynote Doc, event right. thing like like date minutes left until um, user is looking at it or is there or is that so i would like to i mean like putting us there's a couple different sticks in the ground like by so we we talked to kubecon eu about this last year and we spent a lot of the year there's been a lot of people who have like you know kind of poked at it uh, this will be the bit, even something that's more real to poke so having having it in place significantly ahead of kubecon eu is actually a really good goal because then we can actually do much more concentrated you know focus around it uh, that's more of a arbitrary stick in the ground you know years a long time if you can't do something in a year it's probably not worth doing um and we've made a lot of progress um, some other ones probably would be um, prototype two gives us the foundation that allows us to go figure out uh what the concrete places within the cube ecosystem we want to make changes at and start integrating into those so like discussions with some of the SIGs um, and all that. And so the post prototype two kind of is the let's let's get serious about making this um, not just this one idea that you could see, but putting the parts in the right places. OK, so it sounds like the the issue, at least that we're talking about, is the capacity to, to create these types of controllers and not necessarily like a deliverable thing that then goes and mucks with ingress or something so um i'd say maybe we can close shoot issue 284 we have those yes, controllers right and rob and i'll take at least part of the deck building and then loop in other people to help yeah and i think the uh right i think we all agree please let me know if you don't that uh how gross it is to set up these controllers is out of scope for the prototype. Like it, it might be a little gross. We can probably do better, but uh, something is way better than nothing in this case. Yeah, I would say the line is like, if setting it up is kind of gross, but they work really well, I just don't want folks like, oh, you have to know that you manually annotate this object with this thing to even have the thing work at all, you know, like all that kind of stuff. No, I mean, yeah, yeah. The, the, um, in order to write a multi-logical cluster controller, you might need to write code that wouldn't look normal in a single cluster environment. That's going to be the, the case moment. In a little while we can fix that too eventually down the down the road. But for now, it's going to be the case. It's it's basically just a proof of concept. It works. There's a patch client to do that. Um, we have a big work item after Project Two, which is basically API imports, exports, and yeah. that will include a virtual workspace to offers this view onto the right workspaces. And this will be the real basis probably for those controllers. It will be similar. I mean, the basic technology is the same, but um, it will look much different. And that one, that one will something be something we can show and maybe even mock in some, some slides before. Um, there's a call, I think, this week or next week with operator SDK people where we can play through that, at least the concepts, and get feedback. So there's work going on, but it's not all up to. Cool. Um, the next one is multi-location ingress. Uh, is Joaquin here? So many people. Here. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we have this um, use case that says image pool secrets are copied. So I guess we have something that has been copy pasted everywhere. I, I didn't really understand that. So um, from the list of objectives, I would say everything is done. I just want to clarify that the multi-location means that there will be like one active and uh, one active location and a passive location, isn't it? Or we are talking about being able to send traffic to two different physical clusters right now. I think, I mean, I, uh, I am not the definitive answer of this question, but I would say that having the ability to fail over from an active to a passive is, is a great demo. And sure, we should do better and sure we can do better, but for at least for, being, it's, you know, it's infinitely better than what we have now, which is nothing. So I don't know if, uh, if Rob or Clayton or others disagree with that. 
sign that sequels agreement. Yeah, they probably just need. We should probably like. We should probably like write down those like that objective and get that in a in a formal sense of like how, what what are we willing to accept and maybe like the the act of getting the the, the user flow through it will really help because we, we kind of we we left it up to saying like we really want to at least be able to show getting to the right ingress and failover is good but we know that like the sinker will be behind on the failover side so we're going to be a little bit further behind on the underlying infrastructure so maybe we focus on the things that are like let's do a failure that the sinker doesn't react to and and, and focus on those kinds of things because it's still a good demo to have two clusters and show ingress working on both of them one of the clusters like you just shoot it and ingress still roughly does something right that papers over that that's what we're, that's ultimately what all I mean, everybody who has an AWS East region found this out, right? Like at the end of the day, you're just papering over what happens. Like you're not reacting to a big failure like that. You have to have your reactions in place. Um, if you're reacting to it, it's too late. So like a lot of the automation we want to add to the sinker for moving and stuff, that's a happy path and build it, bringing up new replicas. So having like a good um, active passive mindset around the prototype two demo would be like hey look the region goes down the clusters in those regions are also down how do we show the world that we're going to is you're gonna have all this crud in all these other places you need to be able to test that and and build yourself in the mindset of like stuff will fail all over you don't build magic infrastructure that pretends that this stuff doesn't work you know we've already hit the limits of what clouds can do there Instead, you're bringing the pieces together and making it really easy to test what happens so you're not surprised when it does fail. Yeah. I don't, I, I, we've talked about this before, but it would be great to write it down better somewhere that a lot of this is useful, not like you were saying, I'm going to paraphrase, not just for when disasters happen, but to be able to simulate disasters better. And just have just have a chaos monkey constantly killing one of your clusters forever, and that way, when one goes down for real, you don't care because you've been testing it forever. Yeah, Cube, Cube's greatest contribution to computing is uh, delete pod, and that I think is what we're trying. A part of that in KCP is what we're trying to do is we want to be able to make delete cluster or delete node feel equally um, resilient or delete deployment. Yeah, uh, but to Joaquin's question, the the requirement for this prototype, I just want to make sure, is not that um, is not that ingress uh, will always send traffic to both locations, but that when one location dies, the ingress will pick it up and move it. Will pick up traffic and move it to the uh, the passive backup. Is that right? Uh, we, we probably that? we probably need to talk through it because probably it would be the the traffic should go to whatever the active is. But yeah, it could be that we just say like, if the active isn't responsive, it goes to the passive. And it might also be that you can put traffic on the passive, um, you know, if anything weird happens. So we'll just, we just need to talk about the exact scenario. Okay. Maybe, maybe there's something we just like try to get something going this week where we sit down and go through the details of it. Okay. okay. And just to clarify, right now the controller is one workspace only, so it's not cross workspace let's say is that okay for the yeah for yeah okay yeah. If, since since we're still building out any cross workspace machinery i'd say that's that's acceptable and and if we have other examples of controllers and experiences we want to show we should feel what we we are going to work on getting cross workspace controllers narrowly working and then we'll broaden it versus lumping it all together is everybody okay with that i saw some nods hmm emphatic nod okay um david you are next with switch to a logical cluster do you yes understand what that so means? um the main part is is nearly finished i should have the pull request merged uh, this week i hope uh, which is mainly the the virtual workspace that manages personal and organizational workspaces Mainly, you point to this API server uh, path, and then you do get workspaces, and you get the workspaces you have the, the right to access to. Uh, so the, the overall mechanism and machinery is, is there for this. Uh, now, what would be still required to have the whole scenario um, working 
would be integrating with the workspace and workspace shard controllers so that when I get the workspaces from there, um, I also get the cube config and all the secrets that are related to this workspace. And then we would be able to build, for example, a cube, cube CTL plugin, very simple, you know, client side stuff that would get this and be able to switch directly to the underlying cube context uh, that corresponds to, to this workspace. So the, the client part of it, and mainly also the integration with the overall uh, other components, mainly KCP instances, with shards and workspace con and workspace shard controller. Uh, this I still have to do, but uh, this will be probably the next step just after merging the peer uh, for virtual workspace. Do you have a, um, a sketch of what you, you mentioned a kube control plugin? Do you have a sketch of what those commands would be and what they do? Well, do we've we been to... discussing. Uh, uh, I don't. I don't know if there is a. a dedicated document for that, but, you know, typically um, change workspace, uh, uh, you know, you're just by default, you're connected on a, on a cube config, which is just gives you your list of workspaces. And then you do cube CTL get workspaces, you have your workspace, the name of your workspace, and we could typically have a, something like cube CTL workspace change, uh, a bit like what you do with cube CTL context. And then this would, under the cover, point to a sub resource of the uh, workspace endpoint on the virtu workspaces virtual workspace. Um, that would get all the um, related information to build a, a cube config and switch to it. So it's you know mainly just pointing to 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 the virtual workspace with REST uh, to a sub resource and getting the right information. But I I would still have to implement this. REST uh, sub resource, but in fact, it's just uh, mainly just grabbing some information from the workspace work, workspace shard and associated config maps and secrets that uh, Steve already uh, built. So that, that would be a gr you know a great great opportunity to start putting all this together. I think in a in a, in a in a consistent testing scenario. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds that sounds cool. Um, uh, all right, I am now realizing that there was a whole label for prototype two that I have not been using, and that I should have used that instead of the project board. But um, that's okay. Um, we've gone through most of these already in a different order. How exciting! Uh, P cluster health checks uh, that I think falls under the same. Uh, installing an agent flow right now we do something we currently check if the agent we've installed is ready and if it's not then or we can't connect to it then we consider that cluster unhealthy and we that will trigger you know stuff to move away uh i think we have what we have works well enough but we should definitely at least have a design and if not a uh implementation for what to do better that will probably look a lot like or have a lot of overlap with the registration process because the registration process is probably going to look like what uh, ACM does where they take out a lease and health check uh, on that lease. So I think I will, um, this one will also be related to the doc and design for registration and health checks and permissions. Uh, the next one is logical physical cluster namespaces. Is this related to That was, wasn't that like making sure that if you've got two, uh, two namespaces that are identical, but oh. in different logical clusters that we can map them without, you know, yes. having issues in a physical cluster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Transforming, uh, I might rename this uh, to be more clear, but uh, transforming the namespace name on the way down uh, in the sinker. Is it something that would be opt-in or at least that we could disable? Um, I'm thinking of some cases where you want to, you know, um, install some through KCP, some workloads that will finally leave on the physical cluster and that these workloads would expect a given namespace name, you know, because there are a number of things or, you know, controllers or other workloads that 
for some reasons expect to be in a given namespace open shift hyphen something or anything else so i mean in terms of keeping the door open for um backward compatibility of things we would like to run through kcp without completely rewriting them do do we envision having this you know i i don't mind know? having a having a flag to disable it for our own testing purposes and for for you know to unblock short term use cases i really wouldn't want to live any you know in two years mm. with there being the potential for namespace like the problem with that is that if something requires to be in OpenShift dash David namespace. If two things end up getting scheduled to the same physical cluster, they're going to fight or disagree or. Yeah, know, yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, I can um, so we need, but it, so we need to it, be able to push back on things that require to be mm. in a specific namespace or make them unaware that they're not in that namespace, right? There maybe there are other ways we could lie to them and say. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, make them think that they are. We you know fiddle with the downward API if that's what they're using or do something else to. Yeah, yeah, yeah encourage them to believe they live in the right namespace even if they aren't um, yeah because yeah sure yeah that, that could be a, a way to to manage that fine yeah uh, uh short term if they're like while uh i'm building this i don't mind putting in a back door that says like hey disable this for or even just hard coding like like specific namespaces we know cause problems for now and then with it to do to get rid of that over time that seems fine. Yeah, because that's that's all it seems to me that also dependent uh, on the way consumers of KCP want to use that on on the typology, uh, the the plan, you know, um, uh, how they see the association between logical clusters and phys physical clusters, how how they would uh, spread the workloads across physical clusters. I mean, it's mainly related to the topology of this. So, so it might be that short term, yeah. some some consumers would would. It is yeah. possible, I guess, right? If if there is, I think what you're describing is if somebody wants to use KCP for multi-cluster but not multi-tenancy or multi, you know, the, the multi-workspace thing. Yeah. They basically want to, you know, be a facade around n physical clusters with one workspace. Yeah. There is no reason why we shouldn't allow them to have the same namespace name at both levels, but I think that's increasingly going to become a less and less and less. Uh, popular way to run this yep. or supported way to run this. Um, okay, let me keep going. Get out of image pull secrets. I was thinking, I was working on this yesterday. Um, I think it's going to be the simplest possible case of a transformation of a thing that that Sinker will apply. Uh, it won't be simple, but it will be the simplest possible one I've found so far. Uh, and so I'm going to sketch that out uh, and share something I think today and start hacking on that. Um, I say kube configs point to KCP. This one is um, when a workload has a, a service account that requires talking back to an API server, point that API server back up to KCP instead of to its local physical cluster API server. Mm -hmm. That one should also be a fairly uh, simple transformation on the resources that the syncer applies to the physical cluster, but I think it's slightly more complex than the image pull secrets one. So uh, I'm going to do that one after based on the experience I gained from that first one. Uh, so th those transformations would be directly implemented in the in the Sinker code, since those are, uh, you know, really systematic and, and generic transformations, right? Yeah, so so the they will be applied by the Sinker because we don't want KCP, we don't want it to be apparent to users talking to KCP that we're making those changes. I think where that code lives and, well, where the Sinker runs at all is sometimes also yeah, up for sure. yeah. But where that code lives is probably in Sinker code. Uh, yeah. And how to extend it arbitrarily is is still, I think, an open and open-ended question. But at least if we get a couple of these transformations in and then three or four more and then five or six more, then we figure out like the patterns of them mm -hmm. and we can generalize based on experience. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and it might be that some transformations that we know we will always apply would uh, still live uh, directly in the code of the sinker, while some other ones, uh, optional or additional ones, might be uh, um, uh, provided from from some external way. Yeah, I, I, I think there's I think there's a ton of uh, 
open-endedness to this general problem space. Like, when do we want users to be able to disable this behavior? Or how do they want, you know, whatever. But starting with one or two concrete cases that we need to be able to do basic things and hard coding them and then generalizing that seems like a good path forward. Um, and so, and I think that is everything we have listed as a prototype to task. I will go back through and make sure that they are um, up to date, I think we found a couple that uh, might have incorrect bodies, but um, yeah. Uh, with that, I will, I mean, if there's anything else re related to prototype two, any burning questions in anyone's mind, please uh, speak now or whenever. Um, otherwise, I will kick it to Andy, who specifically did not promise a demo of this. Uh, I, I, so can't, no I can't show anything because I was in the middle of um, updating the informer and lister generators to uh, generate the stuff that I had manually hacked into the generated files. And now things are not, um, not in a usable state, but I can certainly talk through uh, what I have done. So uh, the topic is trying to make it so that controller authors and developers don't have to do very much work to make their controllers um, workspace or logical cluster aware. And um, it's probably going to be a bit of a large mountain to overcome to get these, these changes upstreamed and approved to go upstream, but I, I think I have something that's workable. Uh, so I can walk through the code a little bit um, and show you all what I've got. So give me just a second to share code here. All righty. So um, what I've got, can you all see that OK? Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, so, it, you know, if you've ever written a, a controller before, you know that, um, let me get the one that I've been working with. I've been playing around with the deployment splitter because that was pretty, um, pretty small in terms of scope. So, what you typically see is that um, controllers have some, like one or more listers that they typically work with. This one works with a, a cluster lister and a deployment lister. And um, typically, you'll have some sort of um, add event handler call to whatever informers you care about. And so in this case, we're looking at the deployment informer. Anytime a deployment is added or updated, we're going to call this NQ function. And in queue, normally what you would see is a, a, a call to something that looks like cache.meta namespace key funk. And um, so like th this is kind of typical code. You'll call meta namespace key funk. This usually will give you a string for the key where the format is usually something that looks like my name space slash my name. And that is a string that just gets added to a queue. So what I've done is uh, the first change you, you'll see here is that there's this object key funk. I'll show what that is in a second. Um, and then the other big change is that there's, um, so you, you get this key out of the queue when the controller is processing a work item and we're going to take this string k and convert it or decode it into a q key which is an interface that knows about namespaces and names and once you have a key we'll set up a sync context this was something that stefan had suggested a few weeks ago that maybe we could have some way to have a, a context that's controller related or sync related where uh, if you're in a KCP environment and a KCP aware code base, it can 
make syncing work with logical clusters without your controller have, having to be aware of it. And I'll, I'll show how that works in a second. And then when you look at the, the process function, given a key, you don't see anything here that um, talks about logical clusters or cluster names. So it's using the deployment lister, and it's saying, give me deployments for a given namespace and get me a deployment, passing in a context and the key's name. So this looks very similar, not, not identical, but very similar to what you'd see for a normal invocation for any type of lister. The rest of the code in here is all standard uh, in terms of interacting with resources. And you'll even see that the deployment client itself is just saying, uh, give me deployments for the current namespace and just call update on it. There's no logical cluster in here anywhere. And um, that <laughs> the magic is that um, there is a, uh, and now th this is just hacky prototypey stuff right now, but there is a controllers config struct that uh, lets you specify a whole bunch of things the uh, key funk used to, or the, the function used to generate a key from an object and the reverse to do a decode. We have functions for listing everything in an indexer. We have uh, functions for doing a namespace uh, index funk. What is the key for a namespace? What is the key for a cluster scoped resource or a namespace and a name, like a namespace key resource. And when you fill out all of these things, um, the shared informer code, the lister code, the um, everything related to the Delta FIFO and, and all of that is all going to um, make use of what you pass in here. And then everything is transparently available whenever you're saying list with context, get with context, from a lister. So I have a whole bunch of these functions, which uh, assuming this gets approved, or if we think it's it's got a chance to be approved upstream, um, this would be something that we would make available um, exported from KCP. And, and we'd give you a simple, hopefully one liner where you could just say, enable multi-cluster, you know, kcp.enable multi-cluster, and you wouldn't have to code any of this yourselves. Um, but basically, you know, all of these things um, are trying to generate keys that are uh, aware of the logical cluster name. And uh, so for indexes, for keys, everything gets to be logical cluster aware so that when you um, when you are using your controllers, you don't have to worry about any of this stuff. And the one other piece that is important is that the clients themselves are um, now uh, there's a <laughs> there's a KCT, KCP HTTP client that implements a couple of methods um, that the clients need. So the cool thing about client go and client sets is that they uh, they do use an HTTP client. It's it's a struct. It's not an interface. But fortunately, there's only a couple of methods that are used, and those are do, timeout, and transport. And so I have a custom HTTP client that um, this again would be exported by KCP and not something you would have to implement. And it's able to basically figure out is there a logical cluster name in the request context. Um, if we couldn't find one, just use the underlying uh, REST client to, or REST HTTP client to deal with that. And then if we did get the cluster name, then we go ahead and adjust the request URL to include the uh, cluster name in the path. And then we just go ahead and hand that request off. And so um, all of this combined will let you write a controller that does not need to be cluster aware or logical cluster aware. And I will have a demo <laughs> once I fix my code. But like I said, I'm in the middle of doing some refactoring. 
Any questions or comments? Yeah, is, is the, the controller config um, struct something that is global to your command line, to your process, or yeah, something it, that you can set per controller? It's currently uh, global. You can only set it once. Um, mm. the, it was easiest to do it this way for a prototype. I think that it may be more palatable upstream rather than having a, a global variable or a package scope variable to um, potentially pass this in to shared informer factories and controllers and anywhere it's mm -hmm. used. But that is a much more invasive change. So for this prototyping, yeah. I didn't go with that approach. No global so variable. It, it's, so I mean, it's a, it's a global variable that you, it's private to the package. So. What's the, how do you sell it? <laughs> so, are, you um, just, are we just going to use cloud? Like, what's the, I haven't thought about the sales pitch yet. Um, I think that the hardest part about the sales pitch is going to be around, uh, like the fact that we need the, we need a custom function to do an index for listing everything. Whereas like with Kubernetes today, when you want to list everything, you don't need a custom function for that. You just go through everything in the store and list everything because there are not multiple tenants. There's not multiple logical clusters sitting I mean, in isn't, isn't this what an indexer does though, Andy? Like, like the namespace indexer is the same thing. What do you mean? I mean, the indexer, like an indexer is basically going, the assumption being that you're going to want to make calls on this. So you're already in an indexer mindset. I mean, that's basically just what an indexer does, right? Like the namespace. Right. But so the, I have a, you have to pass in the index funk for indexing biological cluster. So. Mm -hmm. Like the code today in upstream Kubernetes, when a when you say list against a lister, it just says um, iterate through everything in the store. Like it does not go to to an indexer to or an index. I guess that's what I'm saying is the default behavior of a cache is return everything in the cache. All subsetting on properties is indexer. Namespace is technically a little special, but Arguably, a namespace should also be implemented with an indexer, so it's a little bit of a moot point, right? Like all subdivision is an indexer. So maybe the argument that maybe one way to make this argument would just be like, maybe the real problem is, is that indexer isn't actually well wired for someone being able to be like, yeah, yeah, like I'm creating a cache, here's my indexers, and this is how I want to mentally map. I agree though, like we're gonna be really careful about changing the semantic of list which is list does mean everything in the cache, not everything on a cluster. So that that's a that's a potential risk point that if we try to change that, it could be, I, it would be very controversial. Well, I, I mean, it, I was... it would work the same for, uh, like if you go with the defaults, the defaults should just be no changes to current behavior. So, you know, if you write a controller and you're saying list everything from a lister, you should just get everything in the cache. Like it's it's current behavior. So this is the sort of thing where we're enabling subdividing the cache where list all doesn't actually mean list all. It means list all within <laughs> a certain scope. Um, but yeah, we're, we're gonna have to work on the arguments here. But, but I mean, that, that again, that could be like thinking about the index, like the point of an indexer is to provide that kind of subdivision. Therefore, maybe one of the ways to frame it would be the, the access methods that you wrap around an indexer, like the lister interface. Maybe that's actually the point at which we say, like, can we go back and re-swizzle it? So any subdivision within list is always going through an indexer, therefore, when you think about a lister, you're always talking like, you know, the lister is connected to an indexer and the yeah. generation logic is about turning indexers into public methods, for instance. Yeah, I, I think that's a good starting point. Um, oh, I had one other thought, but I just lost it. So. I mean, I was even worried about like, hi, Kubernetes. 
I'd like to double the surface area of API interaction or like method interactions on a lister and add a context oh, that's never used. That was my thought. I, and then uh, rewrite a bunch of controllers that are core. <laughs> um, you know, I went with the with context methods, list with context and get with context because again, it's minimally invasive. Uh, if I had just added context to the existing methods, then I have to go fix all the Kubernetes built-in controllers. Um, I would prefer to do that, but it's a breaking change. And um, But I think it's consistent with the client go change from a couple of years ago to add context to all of the methods. So uh, that would be my preference. Yeah, yeah. I it's just like, like those methods are just reading stuff in memory, right? There's no actual async thing that requires a context. So I, I'm worried that even the simpler stuff like that will cause eyebrows to get. Uh, no, that's that's be. not actually true. There are listers in the cube code base that are live listers. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. There, Problem it's solved. not common, but the lister interface. The lister interface wasn't truly intended to be guaranteed to be from a cache. It is optimized it, it, in a weird way. Like lister kind of was, if go was a little bit more flexible about the structure of what we could return, the fact that lister returns an array of pointers is pretty key. Um, and so that was really the key reason that that separate interface existed. So you could potentially make an argument, um, that maybe there's a real problem here is just unifying the client interfaces. Um, and this is more Go peculiarity, right? Like we try to return a, a continuous a, a continuous block of memory for client calls, because that's how we get it. And we don't want to go do post-processing. But when we have a cache, we're trying to pull references out of a map. So it could be that like maybe the argument here, Steve, is maybe the lister interface actually maybe there is a path here to say like, well, why don't we just go fix parts of the client interface and look at generators and listers, um, maybe in a dynamic sense first, like generated clients versus dynamic clients. Um, there's a couple of places where we actually made the dynamic client look a little bit more like the lister interface, uh, unstructured as an example, um, the way that we deal with items. I have a question, Andy. Um... We have the second approach of filtering in formats. Have you looked into doing that in the moment you do the list call, like putting a wrapper, which applies a filter, basically filtering to the cluster you are interested in, and then you get back a lister again, and you can do whatever you want, um, like not adding any different um, new methods, but just one method called filter, which has a clever input which allows us to pass the context in that's a cool idea um why don't we talk about that offline and yeah, sure. see what that might look like might look nicer and what steve said it's ugly to have all those additional functions suddenly well, in the set, i think i, I don't want all the additional functions but yeah. you know if we can sell just changing the signatures that's one approach Adding functions is another approach. Maybe a single filter is a third approach. And I and just I was just worried that like because the follow up here, unless we expect to have a um, a fork forever, like the follow up would be changing some of the core controllers, right? Like the reason we're one of the reasons we're doing this is we can't touch them as they are. Yeah, I, I don't. Agree. I think that I, might be I, hard I, to argue. I don't think this is a goal here. We have I mean, we have different personas and use cases. And I think this case here is about writing cluster aware controllers, not our case where we want to port existing ones, like the handful of those which we have to maintain. Those are, I don't think, the problem. Because they are not. So oh, big. sorry. I thought that was almost explicitly the problem. It, it, no, I think there's only a, there's a couple that are useful, like scheduler. Like, I think this kind of gets into garbage. Like, so the garbage collection controller is the best example we have today of a truly generic controller that runs across workspaces that I could see a clear reason for wanting to amortize the cost of it across hundreds, like a shard or like a large chunk, just because garbage collector on like sets of like five resources is going to, if we run one garbage cr controller per workspace is going to suck. So there's a, very, a, a couple of very specific ones, but I think going along Stefan's point of argument, 
many of like we may not use namespace controller because we may not need it um garbage collection maybe that's maybe we just have a few of them but yeah like focusing on the controller needs of someone writing a multi-cluster aware being able to reuse as much as possible of the tooling having it feel familiar not having to rewrite for instance delta fifo or informers and then i think like but I, and maybe even stefan to build on that point there's a the the mindset after this is like okay good now i want to go write a multi-cluster aware python controller it's not enough just for changes so like we're going to want mindsets that work well with layering client go but then also extend to python.net java everybody who's created some yeah. crazy copy of the qb ecosystem and maybe this is like another place where we'd be incentivized to invest in things that align those those tooling where possible like the generators and all that putting extra time and effort into improving them if the improvements come with a little bit of a uh, little bit of a uh, you know payback uh, for for our use case that's probably something that that's that's what open source is is you scratch my back i scratch yours one last thought i think there's one blocker for kcp would be one blocker if we didn't solve this you want to reuse client go kubernetes clients you want to reuse any other cid client generated by anybody if we ask everybody to regenerate because you want to apply it against kcp this would be a big problem so i think the main goal must be reuse generated informers generated clients from anywhere you want if you then implement something cluster aware on top with custom code like parsing those contexts around that's super fine but the generated code must work as it is yeah um i mean that that's you're saying you don't want people to have to regenerate to take advantage of logical yeah. clusters i don't think that's possible well no no not regenerating to be able to use a controller against a single workspace the minimum delta from like somebody has to be able, like the the use case we have is i've written a controller that works on one cluster can we get you to say oh well, let's go make that multi-cluster aware as easily as possible i might argue and say like it doesn't have to be a zero cost operation because you have to add it but you want it to we want to minimize the um the energy required to get from perfectly working ingress controller written against one cluster to ingress controller written written across 50 workspaces or 10,000 workspaces but like we are we're going for that conceptual like conceptual code effort library dependencies uh if you have to fork your code that may be acceptable but like thinking about like porting single cluster to multi-cluster controllers is like is there a way that like you don't have to actually fork it. Having a new version of a library, regenerating, these are all going to be big friction points. So looking for ways to move that into below where that person has to make that decision because it's already in client go or it's already where it's just like an add-on on top of client go. It becomes very forking forking the ecosystem like all repositories, it should be, I mean, this is harmful and painful. So and I think the thing that the the thing that and Andy's demo was hinting at was that in order to get multi-cluster controllers, you would need to, you know, the, the docs would say like generate, regenerate your informer code with, you know, Kubernetes version X plus and add KCP dot enable multi-cluster. And that's all you need. Right? And that's, that's, okay. that's like the smallest possible diff. Yeah, I think. That's okay. If you can do the pitches as, as Steven. Yeah. Andy yeah. Players. You have to get well, that all on, upstream. On top of that though, right? Like you have the, Call the correct key funks, pass the correct context. Like there's a couple other little gotchas in yeah. each individual controller. And and honestly, like the key funk, like a lot of these are um any place where we can find an example in cube where it's just dumb and improve it. So like listers that back real clients and context is an example of um, you know, uh that's a place where like context might be justified. Uh, additional filter functions uh field selectors and label selectors are like woefully under implemented there's an angle on field selectors which is improving field selectors or coming up with ways of like looking for places in the standard library where we're doing filters after the fact where if we can change the signature of listers client to make those things be like upfront 
and useful to people where you'd say like, yeah, yeah, yeah like I want to filter out 90% of these. Um, there's probably some examples of that where even in the core cube libraries, we would be able to exploit those kinds of advantages. Like don't look, don't miss that opportunity. We can maybe do a review as well and look for some places to help do that. In any case, very cool work, Andy. Thank you. This Thanks. when you showed me last month, I was like giddy with joy, and I'm still giddy with joy. I don't mean to say that in the past time. <laughs> yeah, J Jason's the only one who saw the demo. <laughs> um, I also just real quick, I have a rebase on Cube One Twenty Three. There's a PR open. Um, this code that I was showing built on top of that. So if y'all have time to review the rebase, um, the PR is in our KCP Dev fork of Kubernetes. Cool. All right. Uh, and with that, uh, I'm going to adjourn. Thank you, everyone. And we'll see you all next week. See ya. Bye.